At this time, the Wallingford Inland Wetlands Watercourse Commission is going to call it to order a special meeting for the purpose of a public hearing for application. You had it right there. Sorry. Okay. I had it right there. Hang on, everybody. Okay, application A20 10.35 Research Parkway. Montana construction. At this time, uh, please join me to pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty for all. All right, we'll continue on with the roll call. We'll, uh, Commissioners, uh, Nick, you want to start? Hold on a second. Nick Kern. Deborah, Deborah Phillips. Allie. Allie Robert. Robert Simon. Okay, and uh, Aaron O'Hare, Environmental Planner. And Jim Vitale. But who are we missing, Aaron? We're missing uh, Jean. Jennifer and Mike Caruso, correct? Right, they weren't planning on coming tonight. Okay, so, uh, uh, all right, so we can continue on with the meeting then. Uh, there are some pretty strict rules tonight. One is because uh, I'm not as familiar with this as many of you are, but this is an inland wetlands hearing, public hearing for significant activity. The questions and answers and, and discussion will be focused on wetland issues. Uh, I know a lot of people are interested in truck traffic and interchange and time of the day and all cars, but we've really got to focus on, on wetlands issues. So uh, I, I don't want to moot, uh, moot everybody or anybody that's talking, but if it does get out of hand, that may happen. Okay, I'll start with the applicant, please. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. My name is Tom Cody. I'm an attorney at the firm of Robinson and Cole. Our office is located at 280 Trumbull Street in Hartford. And I am here on behalf of the applicant, Montanti Construction. Um, with me this evening um, on your go to meeting board includes. Um, Byron DeLuc and Rob Peters from Montanti. We also have Michael Kelleher, who is a senior program manager for Amazon.com. Jeff Dewey and Chris Gagnon with BL Companies and Michael Klein, our professional wetland scientist from Davison Environmental. Um, now this evening, Chris, uh, Chris Gagnon is going to run a PowerPoint presentation. And at this time, I'd like to um, ask if the control could be given to Chris so that he could bring our PowerPoint um, up for everyone to see. Mr. Cody, are, are we waiting for, did you say we're Chris? Waiting. We're waiting for the PowerPoint to start. Chris, could you give us an update? Uh, need to make him a presenter. I guess. Just give us a few minutes here. We'll get this up. Well, it looks like I'm not the only one that's got uh, technical issues. <laughs> Tom, do we know who, which box is Chris here? Is it, 
Isn't that correct? Is there a what, what was Chris's last name, Mr. Cody? Gagnon. We're not, we're not showing him in uh, uh, that he's online at all. Jeff, do you have an update for us on where Chris is? I apologize. I am looking into that right now. Um, I will log on. I am logged on my personal laptop, but in the interim, I will log on to uh, my remote desktop. So, in the worst case, at least I can get the PowerPoint going. Please give us uh, one minute. And I, again, I apologize for the inconvenience. <laughs> This gentleman was talking. That was Jeff Dewey with BL Companies. Okay. And Oh, Jimmy Hunt, that's not good. Give me an unmute. You're going to unmute? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cody, is there something we could start in, uh, and come back to this? Um, we could. Jeff, any, any idea here? Are we almost there? Chris Gagnon says he's on the phone and he's um, he's talking, but we're not able to hear him. All we need is for him to get the PowerPoint up. It looks like they're in the upper right hand corner of my screen here, the box in the upper right hand corner says BL companies if you hover on it. But they're muted. Chris just sent me a message that um it's um he, I mean, he needs permission to share the screen as presenter. And he said he's on as BL companies. Yeah. Did you hear that, Katie? Yeah, I'm just trying to find the screen because it's not, there's no picture on it. So all, I, all we have is. Uh, upper right hand corner of my. Yeah, I think it's different on everybody's. Screen. Yeah, they, they're different for everybody. Ah. Uh. It says, it looks like I've been made the presenter, and we're trying to get Chris to be the presenter. Right. We we understand that we're trying to search for the screen that Chris is on. Because it's blank, I'm not, I'm in, We don't we don't have any uh, uh, identification on what screen he's on. <clears throat> this is this is Byron Deloop with Montante Construction. Uh, evening, everyone. We apologize about this, but. Mr. Chair, uh, if if you can see, there's a gentleman in one of the screens sitting at a long uh, conference table. Uh, that is Chris. He's at a he's at a computer at a long conference table in an office. And um, <clears throat> the okay, we found him. We found him sitting at the long table, and we think we made him a present a presentator. There you go, Chris. <laughs> He's Are you on board with this, Chris? Ah, all right. <clears throat> so here we go.
Thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the commission and members of the public. Thank you for your patience. Um, this is our, our PowerPoint presentation. So let's, um, let's begin our, our presentation. Um, next slide, please, is a, um, just an outline of the presentation for this evening. And I will begin with an introduction. Um, I've already introduced our team. I'm going to introduce to you a little bit of the site history. Michael Klein, our professional wetland scientist with Davidson Environmental, will review existing conditions and site resources. Then Jeff Dewey, a professional engineer with BL Companies, will review the proposed site plan, stormwater management, and erosion control measures that have been proposed. We'll then have Michael Kelleher, Senior Program Manager with Amazon, provide a brief overview of the site operations so that you understand how the site would function. Michael Klein will return to review um, his recommendations and a quick review of some other comments and questions that we have received, and then I will conclude. So next slide, please, Chris. This is an aerial photo of the site. And I'd like to just start and just note that most of the graphics that we're going to be showing you will be oriented um, in this manner. And on this image, north is to the left. So the uh, north arrow has been pivoted 90 degrees uh, to the left or to, to the counterclockwise direction. Um, so this is an aerial photo. And indeed, this is the uh, site at Five Research Parkway that was originally developed for Bristol-Myers Squibb and now is the subject of this application for an inland wetlands permit for a state-of-the-art facility for Amazon. The site is located in the middle of the of the image. It's got that orange um, uh, dashed line surrounding it. Um, and I'd like to just give you a quick review of sort of the surroundings for the site. Looking to the bottom of the image, which is to the west, you can see Interstate 91. And then closer to the site, and in fact fronting uh, the site on the western side is Research Parkway. Rotating in a clockwise direction, you can then turn uh, up onto Carpenter Lane, which runs along the north end of the site. There is an existing gravel drive uh, located from the property out to Carpenter Lane. Rotating further in a clockwise direction, there is an Eversource transmission easement that runs north-south and borders much of the east and southeast portion of the site. Further east of the transmission line easement is High Hill Road. And then pivoting around to the south, which is on the right side of the image is Barnes Road or Route 68, and back to Research Parkway. There are two different access points from Research Parkway into the property. Starting at the south end, there is the main driveway into the site. This has been developed uh, since 1984 when Bristol Myers uh, built its facility at the site. And then a little bit to the north of that is a second driveway, which goes into what we refer to as the child care facility. That's a dead end driveway, uh, which only accesses the child care center itself. Looking to the interior part of the site, I'll just note that this aerial photo was taken um, at least a year and a half ago 
because it shows you what that Bristol Myers Squibb building previously looked like. And there it is right there at the center part of the site. South of that building was one uh, large parking field. And then to the north, continuing up the main site driveway spine, there was a second large parking field and several ancillary buildings, including a power facility and a helipad, little helipad right there. Um, coming back down that site driveway, you can see two ponds on the site. Those ponds are sort of bisected by the site driveway, which also serves as a, as a dam uh, separating those pond features. They are man-made uh, features. The site is zoned IX for industrial expansion, and we believe that the site plan complies with zoning bulk and dimensional criteria. Next slide, please. Quickly looking through the history, um, Bristol Myers, first phase of construction was 1984. At that same time, they obtained a diversion permit for the impoundment of the waters in the ponds. They then added to the power plant in 1992. Later in the 90s, they did excavation, obtained an excavation permit, and then excav excavated behind the main building, leading to the construction of what's known as the F wing addition. Yeah, why? 1999, materials handling building was added. That was uh, you can also see in 2002 and 2010 uh, additional improvements were made. In 2018, the property owner, Claire Properties, applied to the commission for an inland wetland permit for a project, and that application was approved in November of 2018, and a modification of the permit was approved a month later. Next slide. This is the original, this is one sheet from the original Bristol Myers application. It's actually the erosion control uh, and grading sheet from 1984 approximately. And it just shows you sort of the, the view of the initial phase of development for the site. Next slide. Can you go back? There we go. Now. This, this slide shows you in orange all of the impervious surface that was installed and constructed in conjunction with Bristol Myers when the site was developed and then improved again throughout the 90s. And what you see here in orange is 1,185,000 square feet of impervious surface which includes buildings, site drives, parking, and access for the site. Next slide. This is a slide that shows you the application that the commission approved in November of 2018. And what this project included, this application included, was two warehouse buildings. And the two warehouse buildings totaled 1,100,000 square feet of building footprint and also had associated parking, loading, and drive aisles uh, across the site. And <clears throat> total site, the total impervious area was 2.5 million square feet of impervious surface. So if you could go to the next slide, Chris, we can see what that looks like. Here in blue, you can see 
how the site was approved in 2018 for the two warehouse building project. 2,572,000 square feet of impervious surface. And this was an increase of about 1,387,000 square feet of impervious surface as compared to what had been developed for Bristol Myers Squibb. Next slide. What we tried to do here with this slide is just give you a visual depiction of how the 2018 application that was approved compared to the development of the site initially by Bristol Myers. And so what you can <clears throat> see is the orange again is the Bristol Myers impervious surface and the light blue is the impervious surface extent for the approved warehouse project. I'm to go somewhere. So I'm not yeah. fucking up. Huh? Now, if you could turn to the next slide, we're just going to turn now briefly to sort of the current existing conditions at the site. I think the commission probably knows that after the commission approved the application for the two warehouse buildings, the project as proposed did not receive planning and zoning commission approval and the project did not go forward. After that, the existing buildings on the site were removed and the current conditions of the site are reflected here on this plan. And what the, Chris is now pointing out with the cursor, the gray areas are the areas uh, where the build, buildings used to be located and they're currently left as just uh, either a gravel surface or original um, sort of foundation slabs, concrete slabs on the ground. You can also see uh, noted the existing parking areas, which were largely left um, as is. And so this is this is sort of the existing conditions. To help the commission better understand these existing conditions, our team recently had a series of photos taken from a drone that flew over the site. And I'd like to show you now three photos that were taken from the drone. And this was just taken um, within the last week. So this first photo is at the south end of the site. So if you remember back to the site plan, we're now starting at that right end of the site looking to the north. So Chris is now pointing out to you with the cursor where the site drive comes in. He's showing you the dam that separates the two ponds. That site drive then went up to that flat gray area there, which is where the building, main building, including the F uh, addition, was previously located. And then you can also see to the right in this image where the southerly parking area is still located today. Next slide. Now we're in a little closer to the central part of the site. You can see on again on the on the bottom part of the picture the two ponds, the drive aisle coming, the drives coming in, the area where the building was located in the parking field on the right. Again, we're looking to the north northeast. And then the third photo is taken now. Now we've flipped our, our perspective and we're at the north end of the site looking to the south. And now you can see this northerly parking area. You can see where the gravel drive is coming in from Carpenter Lane, turns into a paved drive. And then you can see where the helipad is, was located, where the materials handing, handling and, and power plant were located. And then if you were to continue driving down that site drive, you would get to the main building area, which we were just looking at a few seconds ago mm. on that first and second slides. So that gives you an aerial depiction of the current conditions of the site, um, literally from a week ago. So that completes my introduction. 
an overview of site history. And at this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Michael Klein, our professional wetland scientist, to review the work that his firm has done at the site. Uh, good evening. Um, I, am I coming through to everyone? Yes. Can you hear yes. me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Please speak a little louder if you can. Uh, sure. Um, let me see if I can even turn up my mic. Uh, okay. Is that loud enough? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, this is Michael Klein. Um, I'm a uh, wetland scientist and a soil scientist and, and biologist with Davison Environmental. Um, our firm has been uh, working at the site um, since uh, 2018. Um, our uh, scope of services was to identify the resources that are um, jurisdictional to this commission. Uh, to do that, we flagged the wetland boundaries, uh, performed an inventory of the uh, wetland uh, flora, fauna, and hydrology. Um, we uh, identified a vernal pool on the property, so we did a, a detailed survey of the vernal pool species, and we also identified the potential for uh, box turtles at the site, uh, a state-listed species, so we conducted a, a box turtle survey. All that work was done in, in 2018. Um, based on all of that information that we gathered, we completed a functions and values assessment. Um, sub, I've been out at the site um, twice in the last couple of months uh, that information is all uh, still been uh, still valid based on my my field check and, and walks and, and surveys over the last uh, last couple of months um, based on all that information I was asked to review the set of plans that you folks have in front of you and uh, prepare some uh, recommendations based on my assessment next slide please So this uh, slide, again, we're back to the same orientation with north to the left and uh, Research Parkway at the bottom of the slide. The wetlands are, the flagged wetlands are showed in blue. Um, the uh, Muddy River uh, flows um, basically westerly and then southwesterly across the site. Chris, can you um, highlight that for me? It passes through the large pond and then passes off the site down in the southwest corner. Um, there is a uh, single uh, contiguous wetland system uh, that dominates the western portion of the site. Um, that's referred to in our uh, report as uh, wetland number one, and there are detailed descriptions of the different subunits of that wetland. Uh, that wetland system portions of it were um, excavated to create the two large ponds that you see um, the wetland in the northeastern corner of the site is also tributary to um, Muddy River. And so it's, again, part of that same uh, wetland analysis unit. There is a single small isolated wetland near um, Research Parkway, about uh, two thirds of the way north along, along Research Parkway, which we reference as wetland two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, most of the wetlands on the property um, are characterized as, uh, as red maple swamps. Uh, this is a photo from the springtime of 2018, uh, typical uh, lush um, skunk cabbage understory, uh, shrub layer with uh, spice bush and um, winterberry and a number of other species, and then the overstory, the um, canopy dominated by red maple trees. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, a view of, of uh, the larger of the uh, two ornamental ponds. Um, you can see the stonework that's associated with the dam uh, through the middle of that property. And you can see that uh, surrounding that pond, it's primarily uh, been maintained as a lawn. Next slide. Hmm. Turn on my phone. I didn't get it. Oh. Um, the uh, wetlands at the site have been uh, bisected by a number of uh, site oh. development activities. There's a sanitary sewer that crosses uh, the uh, main wetland system, wetland number one. This is a view uh, from the south. 
Next slide. And uh, this is uh, another portion of the sanitary sewer uh, from the northern side. Um, you can see the sewer manhole in front of you, this uh, air, there was some fill placed in this area for sewer crossing, but the wetland remains um, intact. It passes underneath the bridge that you see uh, in the rear. Next slide. Um, as you mentioned, Muddy River flows onto the site uh, from, uh, from the east, uh, from the uh, transmission line right of way, the North uh, Eversource uh, right of way. Here's a photograph in the in the springtime, at a time when Muddy River is is flowing um, more than it is typically. Um, we've uh, observed the river over the course of uh, several seasons and several years, and it um, we're very close to the top of the watershed. There's oftentimes insignificant flow uh, in the river at this point um, in its uh, in its drainage. Next slide. So here you can see the uh, eastern um, wooded area. One of the buildings that was uh, has been demolished is uh, is in the background. Um, this photo is looking easterly up uh, up slope. Next slide, please. Um, Muddy River passes under uh, the main access road in, in two, two large culverts, uh, shown here at the, uh, the bottom of, the, of this slide, uh, the former building uh, in the background again. Next slide, please. And uh, here's the, uh, where Muddy River flows off the site. Um, through a, a, a filled section with a gabion walls and two, uh, two round uh, concrete culverts. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, there is a vernal pool at the site. It's adjacent to Research Parkway um, near the daycare building. You can see the daycare building in the background. Next slide, please. Um, we did do a detailed uh, survey uh, for uh, reptiles and amphibians that uh, might utilize and breed um, in the vernal pool. Um, two of the typical vernal pool species are present, uh, spotted salamander and wood frog. Um, the state-listed blue spotted salamander is not present at, at the site. That was an important focus of our uh, detailed vernal pool survey to determine whether or not uh, blue spotted salamanders were, were present um, there's because they're state listed. The, uh, the photo on the left, um, some people have said that that looks a little bluish and it looks like it's got some blue spots on it, but that's actually uh, just called the spotted salamander or some people call it the yellow spotted salamander. It's not the state listed species. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the reasons for the detailed survey of, of vernal pool activity um, was not only because they potentially could uh, be habitat for a state listed species, which we found they're not, but also because there are um, a series of best development practices for conserving um, vernal pool wildlife. Uh, this is a document uh, authored by Avram Calhoun and Drs. Avram Calhoun and Michael Clemens on um, the best development practices for conserving pool breeding amphibians in residential and commercial developments in the northeastern United States. Um, we use this um, as, a, as a guide to uh, make recommendations at the very initial uh, stages of site planning. Um, the uh, proposed plans uh, do not include any activity within 750 feet of the vernal pool. That's called the critical terrestrial habitat zone and the plans comply with the guidance um, in the Best Development Practices Manual. Next slide. We also conducted, a, as I mentioned, a, a box turtle survey. Um, we have been uh, coordinating with the Connecticut DEEP's Natural Diversity Database, um, and they identified uh, blue-spotted salamanders, box turtles, and a third species, kestrel, a bird, um, as 
known from the general vicinity of the site. Um, the kestrel, there's uh, no habitat for that um, small uh, raptor, small hawk at the site, um, but we did look very carefully at the blue spots and also for box turtles. Um, we found that they are present at the site in very low numbers, specifically only one adult female was identified and also one shell. Um, box turtles are notoriously difficult to uh, get a precise uh, population count on. Um, so based on the presence of one uh, adult, um, we did prepare a box turtle protection plan for the construction phase to mitigate adverse impacts of mortality on the turtles during construction, um, and that is uh, part of the uh, part of the plans for the for the project. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, summarizing our analysis of the existing resources at the site, we used. Um, what's known as the, the highway method um, to assess wetland functions and values. This has become a de facto standard um, in, uh, in New England. It was developed by and for the Corps of Engineers and the Federal Highway Administration, um, and it identifies 13 uh, functions and values that wetlands provide and provides a set of criteria for determining um, which of those functions are principal functions of the wetland, which um, may be secondary. And uh, in our assessment here, we've identified um, those that are uh, unlikely to be present at any kind of a, a substantial level. Um, it, not surprisingly, uh, Wetland One provides a broad range of values at a principal level. Um, the only two that we did not identify as at that principal level would be recreation and uh, uniqueness. Wet, again, also not surprisingly, wetland number two due to its small size and uh, the alteration that's occurred in that area um, only has one function of any significance, groundwater uh, recharge, discharge. The rest of the functions are either unlikely to be present or, or not applicable. Um, the not applicable is fish and shellfish habitat. There's no aquatic resources there, so that, that isn't applicable. I think that may be my last slide. Yes. So um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, BL companies, the engineers, to describe the site plan. Good evening. For the record, my name is Jeff Dewey. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Connecticut. I'm working for BL Companies. And uh, obviously, I was uh, the site designer for this project or part of the site design team. Um, and we're back to the original site plan, a proposed site plan here. Uh, what we're showing here in color is in the dark brown is the proposed building which is 219,000 square feet in area in gray is associated parking loading driveways in the light green areas is the flagged wetlands throughout the site the dark green is upland areas we have uh, the dark blue colors are the two ponds that have been previously mentioned on site and all the uh, light turquoise type blue are the different uh, surface detention basins that are we proposing for our stormwater management as part of the project. Uh, for this project, the total impervious area proposed is 45.2 acres or roughly 25% of the site. As part of our proposal, we are proposing a, a full new site lighting with full cutoffs. Our paved parking areas provide infrastructure for future EV charging stations. Uh, we have typical amenities, the ride chair shelter and smokers shelter. We have a landscaping design that meets the current zoning regulations and a uh, very robust stormwater management system that meets or exceeds Connecticut DEP standards, DOT standards, the Wallingford zoning regulations, as well as the aquifer protection design standards. Um, next slide, please. Our proposed site plan 
uh, we have our traffic is based where we have a, a limited access point on Carpenter Lane. It's a right in, left out only. Basically, we are going to be designing and utilizing the site to focus on the research parkway access way. So right now, as you can see the cursor, that's the Carpenter Lane access, which is limited again, right in only, left out only. So there'll be no right turns on Carpenter Lane and the traffic yes, will be focused yes. on the research yes, parkway. Yes, you're, getting off, you're getting off the subject of wetlands. This is where I didn't want to go about traffic, et cetera, et cetera, parking, smoking area, wetlands. We need to focus on wetlands, please. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. I apologize. Just trying to give a quick overview. I will, I will bypass and we'll move to the next slide, please. Um, basically, what we want to show here is uh, impervious areas between the previous uh, wetland application. This is, as was shown previously, all the impervious areas that were previously approved uh, with a total impervious area of 2,572,613 square feet or 59 acres. Another way to look at it is roughly it's 33% of the site. The proposed building areas was 25 acres or 14% of the site and proposed driveways and parking areas was 2.7 acres or 15% of the site. Which brings us to the next slide and this shows our proposed site in pervious areas and in yellow. Our total proposed impervious surface is 45.2 acres at 25% of the site. Proposed building area is five acres or 2.8% of the site and parking and drive is uh, roughly 22% of the site. So when you overlay the two as we do in the next slide, you can see from the previously approved application, the reduction in impervious areas. Again, what we're proposing is in yellow. As when we overlay it, it shows up in green. So you can see it's a, a fairly substantial reduction in impervious area with our current proposed project. Um, our next slide shows the original Brister Myers developed site in comparison to what we're proposing. And again, we have the current proposal for this slide is in blue with Bristol Myers underlaid in orange underneath. Um, basically to highlight this, uh, the total proposed new impervious surfaces is 42 acres or approximately an 11% increase over the original Bristol Myers impervious areas. So there's a minor increase from Bristol Myers and a substantial decrease from the previously approved application uh, back in 2018. Our next slide um, again highlights this comparison, this difference, but this shows our activity areas. Uh, in, in a nutshell, and I apologize, this is, it, this is difficult to read with the small numbers and so forth, the red areas show where the current proposed project that we are here representing today, where we show activities within the 50 foot regulated upland area from wetlands. Um, the green areas show the areas from the previously approved project. And basically in a nutshell, um, the previously approved Total activity area in upland review areas is six, almost 64,000 square feet, where we're proposing 72. So we have a 13% increase in total activity area in upland review. Overall total activity area on site, we're proposing a decrease of around 16.8%. Um, the previously approved project had 457 square feet of wetlands activity, where in this project, we do not have any activities proposed in the wetlands. The previously approved project had 5,123 square feet of activities in the 100 foot Muddy River buffer area, where the current project has 3,773 or a 65.8% decrease. 
Uh, so basically, in a, in a nutshell, the, for total activity areas, there's a reduction of 13.5 acres or roughly 16.7% decrease in total activity areas. Um, and as a side note, the previously approved project had over 10,000 feet of 10,800 feet of retaining walls where we have 2,500 represented on the current plan. So the, a substantial decrease in the use of retaining walls as well. Um, so now if we go on to the next slide, give you a quick rundown of the existing stormwater and how we assess the stormwater. As you can see on this plan, the site, and just so I'll make a note of it, as you can see, north is always going to be to the left. So the west is always down, east is always up, and south is always to the right throughout the, the rest of the presentation. On this plan, we show the site is kind of to the south of the page that the cursor is circling now. Off-site areas contributing to the site are at the bottom or the west is an E1 dash off-site, which is a 155 acre area that drains to the western wetland band and it gets there through multiple road culverts under Research Parkway and it ends up um, combining into the muddy river in the larger pond that's on site. We have the E2 off-site area, which is 244 acres. This is basically the upper reaches of the muddy river and feeds the muddy river and, as well as our site, but upgrading of our site. This is basically what is providing runoff into the muddy river. And E3 shown as a small area, 24 acres that drains into the central wetland corridor and combines again with Muddy River at the existing pond, uh, the larger existing pond on site. Um, so our next slide gets into more detail of the actual on-site watersheds. So basically, it's hard to see, but again, with north being to the left, at the top of the page, the west, you can see where the Muddy River comes into the site and then flows through into the larger pond. And then there's also a water course that goes from the north to the south along the central part of the site, basically splitting the site in two. Um, the topography, obviously, areas that are to the east, most of them drain westerly into this the area that the cursor was just pointing to that and similarly underneath those areas drain from the research parkway side drain east into that um water course and then drain into the pond which combines into the muddy river um so our, for the next slide shows our proposed proposed stormwater hydrology and it, it's no big surprise here. It's the same thing as before. The on-site information changes, but our, our P1, P2, P3 off-site areas are just as they were under existing conditions. So the next slide will show our proposed stormwater sub-areas as we divide it up as the site was designed. Um, and again, it, it's the same orientation we tried to, as best we could, uh, set up our drainage so have multiple outlets to manage our stormwater runoff to emulate existing natural conditions as much as possible. Um, our, so our next slide shows are basically our stormwater subsystem. We have them color coded so you can see basically which areas are being picked up by which piping systems and which way they're directed. We have basically detention basins on site. Uh, for each detention basin, we have a treatment train approach where um, our water quality volume and flow have been uh, designed to be treated at two different levels. Uh, we have 100% retention of the water quality volume to be infiltrated in each of these basins. We also provide a 12 inch minimum freeboard below the emergency spillway. And we also have an additional 12 inches of the emergency spillway below the berm top. So basically these basins are designed for the 100 year storm 
and still not have any flow over the emergency spillway. So they're designed to not overflow at, for beyond a 100-year storm. Um, and again, we have multiple outlet sites to spread out our discharge locations. We have a total of 12 discharge point discharge points, two of which are roof areas, as you can see on the east side of the proposed roof in orange. It's directed towards the east, southeast, towards the discharge point adjacent to one of our stormwater management basins. And the pink roof area, which is on the west side of the building, is directed westerly. And the, both these discharge points are the same locations from the previously approved project for the building that was in this general area. Um, so if we look at the next slide, this is the existing discharge locations. Uh, the point of showing this slide is basically in the northeast, there, in that parking area, you can see there's two discharge locations shown with the uh, yellow orange. They're up in the more to the north. You can see where the buildings discharge into the muddy river by the pink color. But most of the site, which is purple, including a large portion of the impervious areas, is all into the purple system which is basically discharged into the smaller pond, which is a detention pond for the Bristol Myers site, which then discharges into the larger pond. And again, the point of showing this is to show that how, how much effort we've made to try to have multiple discharge locations versus what's existing and having most of the impervious area discharged into a single location. Um, so for our next slide, it's also as part of our stormwater management system design. Uh, we have a pretty in-depth treatment train. Roof areas are considered fairly clean water, so we have direct discharge, which we simulated from the previous uh, approved application. All our catch basins will have oil water separation hoods and four-foot sumps. Um, all our water quality flow will be directed into hydrodynamic separator systems. Then from the hydrodynamic separator, they will be then directed into sand filter beds. So we have two levels of water quality for that initial water quality volume and water quality flow. A foot beyond the water quality flow will be directed into the stormwater management basin into a sediment four bay that's sized in accordance with DEP standards. Um, and note that the sediment four bay volume is not included in the basin volume while we ran the models. So we uh, assume worst case condition that the sediment four bays are full. Um, within the main bay in each basin, we have 100% storage and infiltration of the water quality volume. So you can see we kind of treat the water quality volume three different times in the design of these basins. And again, we have the 12 inches of freeboard for the max water surface elevation. Um, then the discharge for the basins will go not only into a riprap apron for DEP standards, but we also, wherever feasible, we also included a level spreader to encourage sheet flow, so which takes it a step beyond what the design standards are per DEP for a safe discharge. Uh, so for our next slide, this is just a graphic that shows the different levels of management we're proposing. Obviously, the first top left is street sweeping. The second one is a graphic illustration of what, how a hooded catch basin system works. Your next one is a Vortex type device, which is a hydrodynamic separator to further separate the clean water from potential floatables and, and what have you solid. The next bottom left is this is from um, your aquifer protection district design standard to go into the hydrodynamic separator and then into a sand filter bed, which we incorporated into our basin. The next picture just shows a standard uh, extended detention basin as per Connecticut DEEP standards. And then additionally is a graphic for the riprap apron as well as the level spreader. So our next slide goes through and just details all our proposed treatment plane train component sizing calculations. 
And I'm not going to go through all the numbers. Obviously, I'm going to try to be brief here. But this just basically shows if there's any question that all of our features for our treatment train provide over and above the minimum required. Um, and that's the point of this slide. So if this becomes a topic, we can always come back to this and look at it in more detail. But uh, in light of moving along and keeping it fairly brief, we go to the next slide. And this slide basically shows us typical calculations for efficiency in treatment train standards. And I apologize, I know it's impossible to read. Um, but basically, this shows how it's calculated. And on the bottom is a sample of one of our stormwater management basins, which came out at 99% efficiency based on the standard calculations for removal of these different items, which again, we can revisit if there's any questions, but I'd like to keep moving forward to keep this as brief as possible. Our next slide, this is the detailed design for the stormwater management basins, which again, we don't need to get into detail. I don't need to throw more numbers at you. I'm sure you've already had plenty and there's more coming. Um, but so if there's any questions about any of the detention basin designs, we can get into detail. The analysis point that you're looking at the POS2, POS3, POS4, and POS5, these are five different locations on site. POS5 is leaving the site. This is after that final large pond. So basically, um, as you can see, we have a change a reduction in the peak flow rates for every storm event leaving the site at point of study number five. So if you go to the next slide, it shows, we can show you where point of study number five is, which is down in the bottom right hand corner, labeled as P5, and it's at the outlet of the site. So we, we're reducing the peak flow rates at leaving the site, which is uh, what the intent for the design is. Um, so our next slide is the comparison table. Which and basically this shows um, how we're reducing not just flow rates, but activity areas, areas um, impervious areas. But what's, what's important to note here as well is um, if you're looking at the existing Bristol Myers site, basically there were no sand filters. There are no water quality features at all. Um, there's a, we're reducing the amount of impervious area uh, by 605,000 square feet while also including all these treatment train features that are currently non-existent. There is basically uh, total provided stormwater management, roughly 76,000 cubic feet on site um, for a total impervious area of 1,165,971 square feet. Well, providing a total uh, stormwater management for of 725,000. It's a, it's a whole decimal place more of cubic feet of management basin storage while we are only increasing the total impervious area by about 700,000 feet. So it's, I mean, uh, it's decreasing, I apologize, decreasing by 600,000 square feet or roughly 13.9 acres. So I guess the point is we're providing a lot more storage, a ton more treatment train while we're reducing the impervious area. And if there's any uh, uh, detailed questions on this kind of stuff, we can certainly go through this in more detail. Um, Chris, the next slide, please. So we also have a very detailed uh, soil erosion control. Developing our soil erosion and sedimentation control plan, we went with uh, um, using a lot of temporary sediment traps in place of a few large sediment basins. And we have a few reasons why. Uh, the temporary sediment traps are good for up to five acres where basins are used for larger watershed. Now these temporary traps are designed for a wet volume and a dry volume. So they, there is a point of time, your lower occurring storms, 
might not even have a discharge, but might be pure infiltration, and then, which helps let uh, the sediment settle out, obviously. And certainly we have uh, inspections required and so forth, so they have to be cleaned out as the sediment accumulates inside. But another nice feature of the sediment traps is it, they, they treat smaller areas, so there's more of them required, which having more temporary sediment traps means more discharge points, means matching more to the natural hydrology of the site as opposed to having just a couple of very big basins with focused discharge points. Um, and as well as having more uh, sediment traps, it's also easier to manage your areas because you have uh, smaller areas draining into each trap. So if you have an issue in one of your um, air, your drainage areas for the sediment trap, it's easier to manage that issue than if it's a whole large area draining to one big basin. Um, so this slide is showing phase one of our sediment and erosion control, which is basically the demolition phase. And the sediment traps, their locations will be maintained throughout all three phases of the project. But as in phase one, we'll removal of the majority of the remaining site features, which is basically uh, the road um, and most of the road rather, and uh, a lot of the parking areas and what have you. The things to remain will be the initial 400 feet of research parkway driveway, the maintenance building, the child care facility, as well as the cross country utilities. Um, everything else within the red line shaded tan will be demoed and removed from the site. Um, so our next slide, phase two, is the rough grading portion. This is where we do a lot of the site grading and start installing the drainage, um, the building foundation and what have you. Uh, so again, you can see the temporary sediment traps will take care of small areas and are located far away from our stockpiles and will be maintained through the whole uh, project site during all the, uh, whether it's cut or fill areas. Um, so far as, as far as uh, the interesting part about that goes, which the site lends itself really well to, the northern portion of the site is, a, <coughs> excuse me, the northeast portion of the site is a cut slope and then the in that same general area but to the west is a fill slope so that whole area balances itself and lends itself to erosion control quite well uh, and we do not anticipate needing additional sediment traps or what have you though i'm sure there's a, some fine tuning that we will do um, as a comparison with the, the previously approved application on a side note with earthwork the previously approved application had a raw cut of 1.2 million cubic yards. Our current proposal raw cut is 540,000 cubic feet, which is less than half the amount of material being moved in the, than the previously approved application. Uh, our, the previously proposed net cut was 10,696 cubic yards. Our current proposed net cut is 4,328 cubic yards. So again, our net cut is less than half than the previously approved project. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide please. And so this shows our erosion control for the final construction where there's the slopes are stabilized, the building is completed, the parking lots are paved, and the site is basically completely stabilized. And for my last slide, I'd just like to note that uh, for all of the temporary sediment traps, we include the fair cloth skimmer. Now, this is added to help take away a lot of those very small particles that get um, into the runoff and are very hard to settle out. They have a very long uh, settling time. So this discharge, this method of discharge, helps to get a lot of those fines out of the, st the stormwater runoff that gets into the temporary sediment stuff. And uh, we think this is a very solid approach to keeping the Muddy River as clean as possible during construction. Um, and so at this point, we thought it would be helpful to the commission as well as the public
to understand how this site functions as opposed to the previously approved application where you saw the two big warehouses with small parking areas in support of the big warehouses. So this evening we have with us Michael Kelleher of Amazon uh, to briefly discuss the site operations and give us a little bit of insight onto how this site will actually function. Good evening. As Jeff said, my name is Michael Kelleher. I'm a senior program manager for entitlements for the Northeast region for Amazon. Um, Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure that you are okay with me going over the, the, the day in the life of a, of, a, of a delivery station, since uh, your last comment was just to talk about wetlands. So I just want to make sure I'm in line with what uh, how you want to run this meeting this evening. I, I'm not excited about what you're going to bring to the table because I think you're going to talk about these trucks come in, these cars park there, this happens there. Um, that really, it, it, I think I it's a little remote from our issue regarding wetlands. Okay. Unless, unless you can bring us a very short synopsis of things. Why do you have such a large parking lot associated with such a small building? I mean, if you can bring in that into your conversation and explain in the day of this operation why that relationship is, that may have some value. But I appreciate you asking permission. I, I do appreciate that. I think um, for that that specific question, sir, we have I have another member of my team, uh, uh, Brad Griggs, who could probably answer that specific question better than I can. Uh, and he can speak right now if you'd like. Okay, that'd be fine. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Appreciate uh, the time here. My name is Brad Griggs. I'm a senior manager on Amazon's economic development team. Uh, the purpose for the parking relation to this facility in, in size is that this site will operate as a last mile delivery station. So in order to make the location as efficient as possible, we try to bring as much of the parking requirement for our delivery vehicles onto the location itself. So the area to the right side of the plan that we're looking at is where we park and house our delivery vans. There'll be Amazon branded vans in that blue parking area. So essentially we will have those vehicles stored on site. They will move through the green arrow designations here as they drive along the uh, interior roadway here. They will load them, load and then exit. We have the drivers of the vehicles backfilling the spaces to help make the lot requirement as efficient as possible. So essentially that blue parking area and the re parking requirement there, those are vans during the overnight period. And then in the morning, we will have van drivers arriving on site. That's what that pink area is. They will park their personal vehicles, the first wave in the pink area. They then get into a van drive into the green area, opening up spaces, load the vans, exit the building, or exit the, the loading zone there in green, and head out on their route. The next wave of van drivers backfills those newly opened spots in the blue, and that process repeats itself until the, van, the day's capacity of packages are delivered from the site. So that's why we need the amount of parking for this location relative to the size of the building. Uh, if, uh, I'm happy to go into more detail, but if that satisfies your question there, uh, we're, we're happy to, you know, provide any more or, or cut it cut it right there. And, and the only thing I would add to that is that, as Brad said, the van parking, those are not your traditional uh, parking lot sizes. There they're, 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 they're are uh, much larger parking, 27 by 11 versus your, your typical parking lot parking sizes. So the size may be bigger. Or it may show a lot more, but the amount of parking spots because the vans are the are the uh, Mercedes uh, Mercedes uh, vans. They they need a larger parking spot, so the size is a little bit more deceitful. Uh, is not in line with your typical parking lot at a grocery store or mall. If that's helpful as well. Well, I I think we've all had to go around a uh, uh, Amazon van making a delivery, so we know they're a little yes. bit larger than the car. But the question I do have is, uh, where's the trailer trucks? What's the story with the trailer trucks? So the trailer trucks are the area in red 
on the right hand side of the facility itself. We have enough bays there to allow for the trailer traffic to come through during the overnight period to unload and then they exit. So they do not stay on site. So essentially the trailers are brought on a location during the overnight. They are unloaded by our staff during the overnight period and then they exit the facility. Those trailers are usually unloaded anywhere from 20 minutes to maybe a couple hours, depending on how they're loaded and the way in which we unload them with our uh, staff inside the building. But we anticipate given the 17 loading docks that there should be ample spacing for the trailers to come on site to unload and exit as it, it occurs during the overnight period and is spread out during that time. Okay, I, I was just concerned about if there was some hidden parking area that they were gonna occupy, but they're not. They're gonna come and leave immediately. So that's fine. You explain the parking together. So if you wanna continue on with your presentation. Well, okay, we'll be, I'll be turning this over to Michael Klein back again to discuss his, uh, re his uh, recommendations. Michael. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted, here we go. Uh, this is Michael Klein again, uh, wetlands and soil scientist with Davison Environmental. Um, as you as you heard, um, this plan has no direct wetland impacts. Um, when we uh, that's sort of the uh, the gold standard, if you will, for um, for wetland permitting. The first uh, most important element is to avoid uh, impacts to the maximum extent possible. Here, um, they've been avoided fully. Um, that's partly um, a result of the fact that this is a redevelopment application, and that's always a preferable uh, circumstance to um, going into a virgin site. Um, so uh, in this case, um, the uh, crossings that are required for access through the property have already been created. They don't need to be expanded, so there'll be no wetlands or water courses that will be filled, graded, clear to vegetation, drained, or otherwise uh, physically altered. Um, you've, uh, so then we really focus on uh, avoiding potential indirect impacts. Um, those are, uh, in many cases, focused primarily on the construction phase and the um, erosion sediment control. Uh, at this location, um, as you heard from, uh, from Jeff Dewey, uh, there's a very uh, detailed, thorough erosion sediment control plan. It exceeds the um, minimum requirements of the Connecticut guidelines, the 2002 guidelines for soil erosion and sediment control um, by way of, of two specific examples. The uh, barrier silt fencing is, uh, is triple, uh, silt fence, hay bale, and then silt fence. Um, but uh, perhaps more, uh, more importantly, um, the uh, temporary sediment traps have been designed with uh, the ability, with this fair cloth skimmer. Um, the way that, that works, it may not have been, been obvious to, to some people. Um, it takes the water off the very top first. Um, the temporary sediment traps work by gravity. Uh, the particles uh, settle out. Um, by gravity, so the cleanest water is always at the top, and the Faircloth skimmer skims off the cleanest water first. It provides a very high level of, of treatment during construction. Um, you've also uh, heard that the uh, stormwater management plans, both from the standpoint of controlling quality and quantity, um, exceed the, uh, the typical requirements. Um, there's no increase in peak flows uh, for any of the design storms. Um, perhaps more importantly, because this is a, and we're well aware that this is a public water supply watershed, um, the uh, stormwater quality treatment uh, component is very, very thorough, includes multiple uh, measures and uh, far exceeds the uh, requirements in the stormwater quality manual um, so that um, in the long run uh, during the operational phases of this uh, project we anticipate no 
a significant impact on, on water quality, and we know that's a very important element here. Uh, next slide, please. In reviewing the site plan, we did have some uh, recommendations of ways to, uh, to tweak the plan to um, perhaps improve it um, a little bit. Um, they focus primarily, as I think I mentioned earlier, on um, improving the uh, or maintaining or restoring the, the habitat for wetland associated wildlife, an activity that occurs um, in the uh, upland review area, if you will. Um, and they, um, we, we'd like to, uh, the engineers to look at, and they are looking at um, retaining more of the existing um, forested vegetation in the upland review area, which will be, can be accomplished by making the slope steeper. Um, and then restoring uh, habitat by modifying the landscape plans. Uh, they've been designed at this point in time to meet the uh, requirements of the um, zoning regulations, but we'd like to add in um, improvements to um, focus on more on native uh, species that are of value to wildlife and that would minimize the um, maintenance requirements uh, as well. Um, we understand the uh, appropriate concern for maintaining wetland hydrology. Um, as you've heard, the, um, the plans currently um, provide a much better um, solution to uh, maintaining the, the natural flows than, than what was present on the site under uh, Bristol-Myers. Um, but we believe that they can be tweaked a little further with a modification of the level spreader design to promote more infiltration and also to increase the length of the level spreaders um, so that the flows are spread out um, further across uh, the uh, upland review areas. Um, there is a wetland, we haven't talked much about it, there is a, a, a nice wetland up in the northeast corner of the site. Um, there, it is at the highest elevation. Um, and they're, uh, again, focusing on trying to maintain the hydrology of that wetland by modifying the, uh, the slopes and also by providing appropriate controls to um, ensure preservation of the groundwater environment in that area. Uh, the, uh, the southern property line, there's a, a aesthetic buffer proposed, a visual buffer proposed of white pine. Uh, we've suggested uh, mixing in uh, hemlocks in with the white pine to increase the diversity in that area and uh, provide more more habitat. Um, finally, um, there are a number of places on the site that um, have uh, a significant uh, area of uh, or significant colonization by invasive species. The three that are the most common are Tree of Heaven, Autumn Olive, and Multiflora Rose. Um, and we, while we recognize that these species are um, ubiquitous in the landscape in Connecticut. They can't be eliminated. Um, we'd like to uh, propose, we're gonna propose measures to, uh, we recommended proposing uh, measures to control these species. Um, one of the areas that you see on this slide that, that's shown right, right in the center um, is an area where the stormwater basin, one of the stormwater basins is gonna go and it's also adjacent to a wetland and adjacent to a um, an area that's dominated by Tree of Heaven. Um, we'd like to remove the Tree of Heaven in that area and then um, revegetate this area uh, after the stormwater basin has been constructed with a, a native uh, conservation mix and also native uh, native shrubs. Um, so that uh, large area that you see right now that's presently open um, would be converted to wildlife habitat. Um, next slide. And, and go back one, please. And here's an area, the, the two trees you see, well, forward one, there we go. Uh, the two trees you see there are, are Tree of Heaven. This is an area in the southern portion of the site where there's a substantial amount of Tree of Heaven. And then the uh, shrubby material you see there is primarily multiflora rose. So this is an example of one of the areas um, that we would propose to enhance the habitat. And we have focused those habitat enhancement measures on areas that are either um, mostly invasive or um, 
black mature vegetation. We're not going to cut down uh, existing vegetation to plant new new vegetation unless it's invasive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the areas around the ponds, the ponds were constructed for ornamental and, and some stormwater management purposes, um, but um, right now they're grass down to the uh, down to the edge. Um, that uh, can contribute to um, nutrient discharge into the ponds and doesn't provide any any habitat uh, except for maybe for for geese. We'd like to um, uh, replace that existing lawn again with native trees, shrubs, and grasses to promote habitat and minimize um, nutrient discharges, uh, both on the western pond and next slide. On the eastern eastern pond as well, um, we um, anticipate um, taking the comments from that the engineers, the design team will take the comments from the commission tonight, the comments from your staff, um, some of which have been in place for a while, and some of which we've just received, as well as these recommendations that I've made, and use them to um, produce a uh, a final set of drawings and also a detailed. Uh, impact assessment that will be uh, present for your uh, be available to staff and, and to the commission uh, well in advance of the next meeting. I think that's it. Do we have one more? Yes. Okay. Thank that's... you, Michael. This is uh, Tom Cody again. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that concludes our presentation this evening. As Michael said, we've just received comments from Environmental Planner and um, from the water division we will respond to those in detail um, and include with that some revisions to the plans to reflect those comments um, those will be resubmitted um, and at this point we would be happy to answer any questions that the commission might have well i've got a, a couple issues before we uh, move on I mean, here you have your uh, soil scientists making all these recommendations. I'm sorry, the soil scientists making these recommendations, and they're not even incorporated in your plan. I I, I feel like tonight is is wasn't going to be our only meeting, but I would think you paid this man to come up and do his job, and and you haven't incorporated his recommendations. That frustrates me a little bit. But let's go on to the uh, another thing on the on the um, I think it's on the map. Aaron and I discussed it briefly. Um, but all of this, when you talk about the sediment coming off of that property, I don't think you really understand that the sediment there is is uh, very unique. It's not everywhere as sediment goes. It's a red fine uh, material. It stays suspended for days in the water um, our experience has been flocking has been the only item that takes it out but you haven't addressed that that little skim thing isn't going to take out that red sediment that um, is notorious for that area but i'm going to go on to the commissioners now um, i'll start with uh, nick kern any comments nick no i'm all set jim thank you okay ali Comments, Alan? No, no comments right now. No comments right now. Okay, Robert. Yes. Uh, at any time, uh, the flow rate is that going to change um, going into the muddy river at any time during the season, or is it going to be constant uh, a constant uh, flow rate uh, no matter what time of the year it is? Do you know what I mean? I think Jeff Dewey should address that question. All right, this is Jeff Dewey again. Uh, I'm not 100% clear on that. Are you saying um, it sounds like that you're concerned that we'll be holding too much water back? Yes, that is correct. Or putting too much water in at certain points. That's not normal to that. Hi, Mayor. That. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, basically, our, our uh, flow calculations, and granted, I mean, storms are kind of a, a hypothetical uh, thing to design to to begin with, but basically uh, based on standard analysis procedures and stuff, um, we're really tasked to re 
meet or reduce the peak flow rate. And so what we did is we reduced the flow rates, but only by a small percentage. We're not trying, we didn't want to change it dramatically. We just wanted to change it enough so we met that design criteria. But here again, being conscious of not starving the wetlands as well. Does okay, thank you. Your question? Yes, it does. Yes, thanks. Great, thank That's you. All. That's all, sir. Maybe any questions, Debbie? I'll turn your mic on. Uh, not at this time. Yeah, that's that's a good, sort of what uh, I feel. There's a lot of questions to be asked and answered, but uh, I think we're a little early in the process. All right, Aaron. Comments, Aaron? Yes. First, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, gee. Um, housekeeping. Housekeeping matter. First off, the applicant is required to submit certified ver verification of certified letters were sent out to everyone within 100 feet of the property with regard to a significant impact activity. They did that. They provided the certification, and I trust everyone within 100 feet got the uh, notification. Um, all right. So uh, then I wanted to move on to my environmental planners report that came in well i posted it tonight it was posted late this afternoon on the website digitally it is available for anyone who wants to read it there on the town when i see the website i'm referring to the town website where this uh notice of the special meeting is posted and all the materials as is required when you have a virtual meeting or any, anything that is discussed at the meeting has to be posted there. So any correspondence or reports or maps, all has to be available digitally. So we have done that. BL companies are very cooperative. They did what's called a share file. They posted all their, their maps and so on on there. But I'm realizing that they did not post the PowerPoint, but they will be asked to post the PowerPoint. I hope that doesn't present a problem. Also, to turn in a paper copy of the PowerPoint uh, presentation, which was a great presentation, by the way. I think it clarified a lot. It was uh, very well done. Uh, I think the colors help a lot. It was, it was very good. On such a big site, this is so hard. There's so much information to convey. And I think this PowerPoint did an excellent job of at least uh, the overview, presenting the big picture uh, physical outlay and so on. We haven't actually gotten to some of the more hairier environmental issues on this on this site, but as far as giving a big picture, um, as far as the past with the original Bristol Myers site, the 2018 application, and the comparison to what's in front of the commission today, I thought it was an excellent uh, visual presentation. And, and they summarize the information well. Um, so uh, back to the um, what was presented as housekeeping. Let me get back to that. The notice requirements were met both in the town hall and in the uh, local paper. Um, and uh, back to the environmental planners report. We've had a tremendous amount of information come in. Since the original submittal was October 6th, that the application and the materials were received at the Wetland Commission's October 7th meeting. Since then, we've had additional information come in, some of it supplementary. It wasn't ready maybe at the outset. Some of it is in response to comments from my office or in response to comments from the engineering department office and or the water division the water I, i'll stop there and say the water division uh comments came in friday they are very lengthy they are posted on the website on the town website the town of wallingford's main website under the uh the notice for the special meeting tonight this meeting and uh they're very lengthy they go on for eight pages because they have a lot to say they care deeply about this the watershed this is the this area is the headwaters of the town's uh public drinking water supply watershed so
So what goes on there um, has to be reviewed very carefully, and they do not want the water quality to degrade. I think if you could sum up one, their comments in one term, it's water quality. <laughs> and any anything that goes on this site that might in, impact water quality is um, of foremost importance to them. And of course, water quality is synonymous with uh, the health of wetland systems. So. So that works for our commission too. Um, and their pri I can draw attention to something they bring out is that their primary concern maybe in regards to water quality is the difference between this proposal and the last proposal in, to, contrast it, to contrast the two proposals, the 2018 proposal and this one is the greater surface area in terms of parking. So overall, I believe the, um, I mean, Jeff, do we could give me the exact figure, but there's a decrease in surface area overall, impervious surface area, but there is much more parking area. So roof water is considered clean. Of course, it's not 100% clean, but it's basically clean water that falls on a roof and pours off the roof versus water that flows off a parking lot during storm events. Uh, so their concern, the water division's concern, and it's my concern too, and it would be anyone who cares about wetlands and rivers and such, um, is the quality of the water coming off these parking areas. And we will be working with them. I'm sure that they just got those, the, the applicant's team has just gotten those comments on Friday, Friday night, Friday, late Friday. So I'm sure they'll be working to do whatever they can to improve the treatment train, as it's called, any pre-treatment of the water before it enters of the flows, before they enter the various wetlands and rivers. And that reminds me, um, I wanted to refer to the PowerPoint I believe Jeff Dewey, the eng project engineer, could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a lot of the, or a fair amount of the material that was presented tonight was new. I mean, there were, I don't know how, maybe 30% of it was new. Is that correct? That hasn't been submitted yet? Uh, hi, this is Jeff Dewey from BL. No, actually, um, we did some color exhibits, but we provided you with all the exhibits, with links to the exhibits, and all the tables and all the information provided has been either taken from reports or provided to you. All right. So do I understand you to say that I have paper copies of every chart and every plan that was displayed tonight? Is that right? On, on behalf of BEL, I would say yes. Um, I would ask uh, Mr. Klein to opine as far as his information to make sure you have all of that. Um, either way, we certainly can provide you with uh, whatever is lacking. Yeah, right. this is uh, this okay. is Michael Klein. Um, the uh, existing conditions and functions and values were all described in the report that was submitted with the application and my um, my uh, understanding that my um, I had written a letter um, with uh, detailing the recommendations that I had, and it was uh, last week, and and that was I believe submitted. If if not, we'll make sure um, it's there. But I think I think the point that that Jeff was making is that in some cases there are graphic um, graphics that combine some of the information that's in various places, but there's no new information. Thank you. Okay, yes, and yes, uh, Michael Klein, yes, we got a copy of that, uh, your letter that was, I think, submitted on November 2nd, um, mm -hmm. as well as, but mo I will point out, most of the material you referenced tonight was from 2018, is that correct? Or have you done box turtle surveys, amphibian surveys, and all these uh, function and values uh, analysis of the wetlands? Since 2018, I think most of it was from the 2018 information, is that right? Yeah, the background information is from 2018, but I've walked um, the site on a couple of occasions, spent um, the better part of, of two days out there to uh, verify that that information is still uh, accurate. At this time of the year, um, we couldn't do any um, vernal pool or box turtle amphibian sur 
pernal pool amphibian or box turtle surveys, but based on the fact that the site uh, conditions haven't changed in any material way, there's no reason to believe that that information is uh, is not still accurate. All right, thank you. Um, once one since Mike, we're talking um, we're talking with Michael Klein, wetland scientist. One thing I stress in the report is that we are looking forward to receiving a wetland impact analysis from you, Mr. Klein, um, meaning site-specific, anywhere yes. on the site where the wetlands or watercourses will be impacted in any way. Let's say they're proposed to receive an inflow of discharge from sediment traps or from a finished storm basin or if there, there's going to be grading near them or clearing of forest and any kind of impact because this is the wetland commission so we're going to be interested in in the wetland impacts uh, un understood the um based on my initial review of the plans and based on um the fact that we we were quite certain we would get some detailed comments from the um Water and Sewer Department, and from from yourself, uh, uh, Ms. O'Hare, we um, realized that the, there would be some changes made to the plan, and there wouldn't be um, appropriate uh, use of uh, either either my time or the Wetland Commission's time or your time to go through a detailed analysis at this point. Um, particularly since, uh, in addition to your comments and the other staff comments, you you've indicated that um, you'd like to get some peer review. Uh, or at least you're recommending that the commission consider a peer review um, and, and we'd like to um, be as thorough and as complete as we can in as few submissions as possible to make it easier to follow all this. So yes, we anticipate a detailed review. Um, we've begun that, but uh, considering that we know, uh, fully expect there's going to be some changes made, um, we held off on finalizing that and submitting it until those changes are made. Yes, understood. It's sort of, there's a lot of flux in this application, especially after receipt of that water division uh, commentary. Right. Um, may, I wanted to pick up, if I could, Mr. Chairman, on some points that Mr. Klein made about the, he mentioned the peer review. Um, wow. <laughs> That's yes, the peer review. Get, get to the peer review, and we want to move on to the public. We can come back, but uh, okay. you, you want what? What peer review were you suggesting? Uh, I was Which suggesting, and I put in the report the same peer review we had done actually in 2018. And for the um, 2018 proposal, uh, we retained a peer review um, of the erosion control plan. Uh, uh, norm normally, we don't do that. We can take care of that in-house, but this is a 180-plus acre property. It's an enormous property with a lot of moving parts, a lot of different wetlands and rivers and so on, and a large development project plant across a lot of the property. So, so it would behoove us to have a review, a very detailed review of the erosion control plan, seeing that erosion control is the number one thing to keep these rivers and wetlands clean. And that would satisfy the water division. We need some a very detailed um, review in that regard. Um, and before we close tonight, Mr. Chairman, I, w I would like the commission to uh, make it come to a, dis, a determination that we will require a peer review study done of, and that would the the expense of such a study would be picked up by the applicant. Okay, we'll come back to that then, Aaron. A second peer review study I'd like to propose is the uh, hydrogeology by a hydrogeologist, a professional hydrogeologist. Uh, we haven't really gotten to that subject yet, I don't know if you want me to go talk about that a little bit more. Well, uh, we can bring it in now. Are they, are, uh, is the applicant familiar with what you're requesting? I did me mention it when I met with Jeff Dewey last Friday. Um, they probably haven't had too much of a chance to pursue that at this point. Um, what this, 
what I'm referring to is is not a hydrogeological study for the entire site. It would just be for the uh, northeastern quadrant of the site. Uh, we actually did have a hydrology study. It was not done by a peer review last time. In 2018, it was actually done by the applicant. Uh, when, when concerns were raised about um, a dewatering of the central wetland, that large uh, swamp system, the biggest swamp system on this site, there were concerns that with cutting down, now at that time they were cutting down 76 feet into the slope, the uh, eastern slope up there, and removing that material and getting down into the bedrock considerably, and that that area acts as a was sort of bedrock aquifer. Um, in doing that, the water that usually takes months, weeks and months to percolate down through that system, down gradient into that large swamp below, would be leaving the slope very quickly, would be seeping out. And the initial thought was to collect it and pipe it off, pipe it off, um, pipe it off down gradient, get rid of it. But then it would be it would create a dewatering of that system, which would eventually create, it would eventually dry up the swamp down below. Because that serves, that area serves as a reservoir. For not a surface reservoir, this is a groundwater reservoir. So when per precipitation falls on that area, it infiltrates, some of it goes over land, some of it flows over land, but a lot of it infiltrates and gets held down below in the deposits down below, and then slowly released over time to gravity, going down gradient into this, and it eventually ends up in the swamp down below. Well, Aaron, this, Aaron, that that geology report they had last time was it done by a, a licensed firm? Was it a, a legitimate report by a licensed company? Yes, at the time, I can't remember what the name of that company was at the time. I haven't gotten it out are of the file. Are, are this, they submitted that report again for this application? They haven't yet. Um, now, of course, they're not cutting down quite as much. That was 76 feet. I think they're cutting down at the most 42 feet in the back there. So it's not... All right. Are they objecting to hiring a, a peer review for that geology reporting? Oh, have, are you talking to me? Cody, are you objecting to uh, us requiring a peer review of that situation? No, Mr. Chairman. We don't object to the to the peer review of the erosion control plan. Um, we are intending to submit <clears throat> the plan that would the uh, report that will be prepared by Terracon. Terracon did the last hydrogeology report, and um, as Aaron mentioned. Um, I don't know that you got that peer-reviewed last time, uh, but the applicant did submit a report from Terracon. We would we would do that again, have them look at this plan and and send you that as well. So I don't know whether you need to have that peer-reviewed, but we will be submitting the work of Terracon. They are um, licensed in this area of expertise. Aaron, why don't you review that situation rather than a, um, unless we need to require another peer review of that gentleman's work. Maybe we could receive that report that Attorney Cody just mentioned from Terracon and take a review of it internally here in the town and then decide if a, a peer review would be required of it. Okay, that, that sounds like a plan. What else you got going, Aaron? Um, well, just, just again, back to the housekeeping, the first part of my report, I go through a lengthy um, regurgitation of, of a listing of all the items, all the app documents, correspondence that has come in, because it's hard to keep track. There, this is a big site. It's a big, big project. A lot of information will be coming in. A lot was requested. And the applicant has gone above and beyond with doing a lot of comparison studies. Uh, okay. And right, so, so there's, 
What's the I did that to keep track. So it's going to be hard to keep track of this, but I did it for the commission to be able to keep track of all this stuff. Now, um, going on into the uh, major issues right now, the left, I mean, the engineer has his hands full coming. There's been a lot of questions and concerns, I'm sure, and a lot of uh, – the site plan has to be cleaned up, et cetera, and they're going to be working on this. But the big picture items, I think we've talked about, the hydrogeological, the erosion control, and um, the impact to the wetlands. These are the, the three big picture items from, from my perspective. Okay. All right. So let's move on from here then. If you're all set for the moment, let's move on from here. Thank you. Uh, at this time... Uh, We've had people request some information via the chat room. Um, some of, I'm going to go through and and, uh, uh, and answer them or request the applicant to answer them. Um, one question was if there was a fuel or oil spill uh, from one of the vans or tractor trailers. That's the purpose of the oil water separator that's in all the parking lot systems, no matter this application or uh, almost every one that we approve has some kind of an oil water separator system to, to prevent the, uh, that impact to the wetlands. Um, there's another question in regards how many trucks or vans, that's not really pertinent. It's the square footage of impervious surface, um, exhaust tox, toxins and packing wetlands water quality. Um, I don't think that, that, I have never come across in the 30 years that that has had a relationship to wetlands. Uh, now, this this one though impact of winter road and parking treatment and, or snow ice conditions. Now, uh, they haven't pointed out where their snow storage shelf is, and the, and that's usually on the plan somewhere. We'll I'm sure they'll bring it up next time, but somewhere off the edge of the parking lot that is. But I think the best one to to control that has been water and sewer. Um, in their letter of recommendations, they're very clear about no parking lot containing more than 10 parking spaces shall use sodium chloride for ice control. Only products or materials which do not contain sodium chloride shall be used for snow and ice removal. Um, the the other, they're not getting uh, heavy sand anymore, but, but uh, I'm sure uh, they're going to have maintenance. They, some of the detention ponds, that's the purpose of the detention pond, is to, to keep that uh, salt sand mix there to be cleaned out or to be uh, addressed. Now, the oil water separators that are catch basins, they're going to have a very active um, maintenance schedule on it. They showed you some with a sweeper. They showed you some with a vacuum. Uh, before the application gets done, I think they have, uh, they're aware of a highly a high maintenance program, and we will definitely require one. Is it the next question was? Is it true that this new plan produces almost 14 acres of woodland compared to the previous approved plan? I think Mr. Klein may have an answer for that. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, is it the, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, paraphrase or, or move on. It is it true that this new plan produces almost 14 acres of woodlands compared to previous approved plan? I, I'm going to think it's the area that you showed was a lawn that was mowed that you're uh, requesting to be planted into um, uh, various uh, natural habitat for or, or various vegetation for natural habitat. Yeah, we can. Um, I, I, we haven't um, computed that area yet, but we will definitely provide that as part of the um, as part of the update and the impact assessment is how much additional habitat will be created. Okay. Uh, another question was about snow melt and removal. This is, I think, we already addressed it. Uh, another question was regarding noxious sediments disposal removal from the site from the temporary sediment traps. I, I don't think there is. Most sediment traps just capture the sand um, and run off from the construction site. Uh, noxious sediment, 
Um, I don't I don't see how that quite fits here. A snow removal plan again is this similar to the um, there'll be a snow shelf they're going to be pushing it on and uh, control the sand and the salt. Um, there was a discussion about the posting public hearings on the property. Um, one question that it came down to with a with a sign saying public hearing out on Research Parkway be helpful. Um, that's nothing that we've ever came across. I don't believe it's any kind of requirement in in um, uh, state statute. Uh, next one: instructions on how public can call uh, has public who has called in may ask a question. Okay, I think we're gonna we're not done with all the questions. I'm just trying to run through the brief brief here. Uh, Okay, Wallingford residents want everything peer reviewed. We also want DEP directly involved. I think, uh, Mr. Cody, this has to go to DEP also, correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, it absolutely will be reviewed by DEP because a, um, a pollution prevention plan will be required as part of our stormwater general permit filing. So, sir. All right. Um, we may not. The question goes back. We may not be required to post signs, but everyone who who's in this has got notified through the through mail on the hundred pound boundary line. This is the last one. Um, so, yeah, plan for downstream water monitoring during this and after construction. Well, during construction, this there the what has been discussed and what was hired before was an outside consultant that would review the soil and erosion control measures and then be on site to monitor them to see that they work to see that they're they're if they're not if they're breached for some reason they'll be fixed to see if they're in preparation for an oncoming storm so i think there'll be some control going that uh, monitoring water downstream um, if it gets I haven't I haven't gotten into monitoring the water downstream okay I've run through a list but that's still not uh, satisfying some people um, at this time I'll entertain people that would like to speak at the the meeting tonight just please keep in mind that this is a wetlands uh, activity and uh, your comments should be regarding wetlands. Is there somebody who wants to come on? I'm, I'm here, Jim, Ed Bradley. Hey, Brad. Hi, Ed. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Uh, <laughs> let, let me just start with uh, giving the applicant uh, a little background on about the residents south of the site and also uh, Spring uh, Spring Lake. Uh, during the construction of the Bristol Myers site, uh, we suffered air repeatable damage uh, to not only the WPD area, but also to uh, Spring Lake. Spring Lake is a seven plus acre lake and at the time when Bristol Myers was building, it was under the purview of the Army Corps of Engineers. I know their regulations have changed since that time, so I don't know uh, if there is or isn't uh, involvement uh, with them. I have a question for the Inland Wetlands Commission have uh, has the commission uh, reviewed the proposed text changes to the WPD district uh, regulations, most notably uh, paragraph B, items number one and number two. In item number one, they strike out criteria for class A drinking water supply. In item number, I think it's two, 
although they have a one by it. They're changing the amount of, uh, looks like the volume. They're striking out 0.5 to uh, generated uh, and uh, equal to the volume of, uh, I guess, one, uh, one inch. But my question is, have you guys seen them and uh, reviewed them? I only heard about them uh, earlier today uh, that they were formulating some new regulations. Other than that, I have not heard what they have. I, this, as I say, I don't know what they what they have said. Aaron has been involved with them on it or knows of them. That's where I got my information. Um, but you're you're uh, you're the first one that has come up with with uh, a concrete what, what what the proposals are yeah i uh, i listened to their meeting they took no action uh and they uh talking uh with uh tom talbert uh he did state that they probably would be on the uh next meeting for a public hearing well Ed, don't but, don't you uh, think they would have incorporated it in their eight page letter here I, that's, that's what puzzled me in that, especially when we're dealing with, well, you know, it deals with the X zone and the IX zone. That's, I think, out of your purview. But the uh, WPD district, I think, uh, I think uh, you guys would have a concern on what's being changed there. Uh, I, I... I would. I think we would also. The only thing is, I, I can't believe that they're re reducing the requirements in the uh, WPD zone. Yeah. Well. Well. I'm looking at them, and they're they're all strikeouts. And what they say is that what what's being struck out, uh, you know, is being removed from uh, from the reg. You know, there's additions and deletions in there. Yeah. Well, I don't think we can do anything about it tonight. We've got to deal with what uh, we have in front of us. But I know um, Aaron is in contact with water department quite often. So uh, we'll have to see what information she can get back to the commission. Right. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, as, as far as the residents, uh, we're in R18, we abut R40, and we're, R40 is just south of the uh, IX zone where uh, the water from the, uh, I'll refer to it as the Bristol-Myers site, uh, where it comes, uh, flows out across uh, Route 68 and uh, comes on down. And uh, I mean, the Muddy River flows right by the uh, west side of my house into uh, into Spring Lake, and naturally, we have a, have a concern when whenever there's upstream uh, construction uh, in the uh, impact to the uh, to the lake. Uh, I thought I heard the applicant uh, that they uh, do have to apply for. Uh, DP will be involved. Uh, what type of permits uh, will they require? Mr. Cody? Mr. Chairman, it's Tom Cody. The applicant will be required to apply to the Connecticut DEP for a stormwater general permit. Um, it's, a, it's a registration form and it includes um, a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So it is a detailed review of the applicant's approach to stormwater management and pollution prevention. And the DEEP has to sign off on that before site work construction activity can start. Okay, and the last I recall, or at least testing down this end, uh, the water classification by the state was double A. Uh, who and when will water be tested up on your site? Uh, 
Well, we haven't, you know, speaking for the applicant, we haven't, uh, you know, considered a testing plan yet. Um, but we've heard the comment and the question asked, and, and we'll look at that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, can I jump in? Go ahead. Oh, I just, it, it, toward the end of the Water Division's uh, eight page commentary, yeah. uh, they do mention that they will be requiring testing. They want permission to go and test. I think it was every four months or something. Maybe somebody has that in front of them. Uh, so the Water Division wants to test the Muddy River on site right throughout throughout the development process. I don't okay, know how the, the applicant, if the applicant wanted to react to that request from the Water Division. Well, I mean, the comment speaks for itself. So we'll we'll review it, and, and in, as part of our response, we'll we'll give you our thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, and you know, I'm not going to go into uh, detail on uh, Eric uh, Kruger's uh, memo from the uh, water water sewer department, but he he raises. Uh, uh, several uh, concerns. I'll, I'll just make note of them and you guys can, uh, I'm sure you've already maybe read it. Uh, page two, the second, uh, the second paragraph, you know, stating major concern to the water division, then it goes on. The third uh, paragraph, uh, page, uh, page four, uh, the, uh, the uh, item number one, the parking and impervious areas, uh, that's been uh, spoken to. But uh, on page five, they do, uh, the water division, uh, that the percent increase in paved area for the current proposal over previous proposal is an increase of uh, 19 uh, percent. I saw that, Ed, and you know, the interesting here, I heard a lot of numbers from um, uh, Jeff, I can't think of his last name, I'm sorry, um, the engineer for BL, uh, we're decreasing, we're decreasing. Of course, the 19%, uh, is that in, in respect to the uh, pervious versus impervious surface or in respect to uh, uh, pervious versus roof? area i mean it, it you really need to read the whole paragraph on that i think the increase is is uh uh there's more to that that statement ed yeah I'm, yeah i'm, I'm not in with it by any means paved area. yeah paved and, you know, area. yeah it but it, it 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 opened my eyes up that the fact that the um between warehouse and proposed parking versus this new building and proposed parking, there was quite a bit of difference in in the relationship of them. That's why that's why I asked about how come the increased size of the parking lot. Sure. Uh, the other the other quite other question I have uh, of the applicant, uh, there is a gate valve on the dam. And what is the procedure to uh, control that gate? And also, uh, what what's the if if you know the current condition of the gate on the dam? Does anybody review that, Mr. Cody? Um, I, Mr. Chairman, I can't speak to that myself. I will ask um, Jeff Dewey if, if he uh, can speak to it, and if not, we will get you an answer to that. Jeff, do you have any any insight into the gate valve? Uh, no, sir, I do not at this point. We have not looked into that gate valve and how it operates. All right, we'll do that, Mr. Right. Chairman. That Mr. Chairman, can I chime in here? No. No? Um, not at the moment. And let me go first. Uh, from what I understand, Ed, that there's a discussion on 
drawing down the pond during construction so that pond had capacity to handle a um, hundred year storm if it got out of control. Um, both, uh, I think BL is, is looking to do that and the water and sewer company department is looking to do that. So in doing oh, that, okay. I'm sure that the function of the valve being um, able to be worked, able to be done on, uh, it'll be operational before the project starts. All right, Aaron, go ahead. Well, that's basically what I was going to say. In the 2018 proposal, uh, the gate valve is instrumental in the drawing down of the pond in case of a large storm event. It also was going to be used to draw down the pond throughout the construction phase, which we haven't gotten any information yet on if this proposal is also going to draw down the ponds throughout the construction phase. Maybe uh, Mr. Do uh, Jeff Dewey can speak to that. Well, it's early. Uh, it's early. The question was regarding the, the gate valve. Why don't you go ahead, Ed? Okay. Uh, the applicant, one of the applicants made a comment that flow control would not impact the, uh, the wetland. Uh, what can, how are they going to control that? Say the first part of that again, please, Ed. Yeah, the app, one of the applicants made a comment that flow controlled flow not control. to impact the wetlands. My, my question I don't is how that specifically. Um, do you, Mr. Cody, do you know which one of your team might have said that? I believe, Mr. Chairman, that um, this question may relate to. Um, ways that we're looking at reducing the amount of activity um, within the upland review area. And one of the approaches that we've looked at is by increasing the slope, we can pull back the amount of activity within the upland review area. And there are techniques that are well documented to work that can control those slopes. And um, Jeff or Michael Klein, either one of you can address, you know, those techniques and how we can accomplish that. Do you want more clarification, Ed? Yeah, I, well, I would, I mean, are we talking more sedimentation ponds or, you know, to control I, flow? Or are we I talking think, about, go ahead. Well, my, my opinion, in listening to that is if if they have to generate a, a uh, um, less slope less percentage of slope the base of the slope will be out into the upland review area more if they bring the slope steeper the base will not be in the upland review area as much a am i correct uh mr klein or am i mistaken Now turn your mic on, Mr. Klein, or, or Mr. Mike. Cody. Michael, can you address that? Is that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, you're absolutely right, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, in this particular circumstance, um, we believe that there are methods that can produce a stable, non-erodible slope that and still steepen those slopes so that there's more upland review area retained and available for um, habitat for wetland associated wildlife for attenuation of the treated stormwater discharges etc and that's one of the primary uh, modifications that we're actively considering um, to be included in the revised set of plans so so your control is basically um, landscaping the land, cutting back the slopes to control the flow. Well, it's not uh, the uh, the chairman I thought was asking a question about um, maximizing or the relationship of the slope 
final slopes chosen and slope stabilization methods chosen to how close the Tove slope would be to the wetland. To the wetland, okay. And, and we believe that um, there, well, we know that there are uh, methods available to uh, stabilize the slope short of the uh, 10,000 feet of retaining walls that were in the proposal that the commission approved, but which will allow us to pull the slopes back and provide more um, area adjacent to the wetlands in which um, can be utilized by wildlife and also will serve to dissipate the uh, flows from the stormwater management system and recharge the groundwater. Okay. Uh, j just to note that the Muddy River, okay, I'm not talking about way up in the north east corner. I'm talking about south, uh, maybe as it exits the site. That river never, ever runs dry. Even in this drought, it continued to flow. Has the flow been diminished? Yeah. Uh, have we, we lost maybe a third of our lake? Uh, right now, it uh, appears to be full uh, to capacity. But even talking with residents, uh, one farm lady, when we first moved here, who was in her 90s, she also stated that that river never ran dry. Never ran dry. Jim, uh, one, one final question. I know you got a correspondence from uh, Jim Heilman, and I have to agree with him on uh, hiring, I think the town should hire an independent qualified hydrogeologist uh, to take a look uh, at that whole area. He, he raises a, a good question on uh, recognition of where the source, source water maintaining the wetland comes from. Uh, you know, I can't answer that question on site there. Uh, I can tell you that Spring Lake uh, is named Spring Lake because the bottom is fed by springs. So uh, my recommendation would be for the town to hire an independent uh, hydrogeologist uh, to do a uh, do a study. Uh, that's my questions. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and uh, Jim's letter is an excellent letter, and he's brought to light uh, the question of that recharge of that area, and uh, yeah. that's one reason why. Um, we discussed with Aaron earlier about the geology report and this site. It was primarily driven by Jim's letter. Um, the, uh, but I think that the point taken, if the applicant gets his geology report in, I think by next meeting we can decide whether it needs an outside peer review um, or if see what the internal people um, up in the engineering staff, up in the public works director, up in the, uh, upstairs to, to in the town hall to see what what's pinned. So I think that sure. that's we got that. It's something that we want to look at. Uh, yeah, and please take a look at the watershed uh, protection district. The changes, the text changes. It's quite interesting. Well, I think Aaron is on it because I know it's on next month's agenda. Uh, on our regular meeting to, to at least have a communication about it. Is oh, this, okay, is good. This okay, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ed. Okay, uh, is there another uh, person that would like to come online? And for the record, name and address uh, for the record, please. It might have been someone on the mobile phone calling in. Okay. Uh, at this point, there, there doesn't seem to be any other issues or, or callers. Um, does any of the commissioners have any other questions they want to uh, ask at this time? 
I know some of them have been dealing on the in the chat room, which has been great. It's given me a, a lot of help. Okay, Aaron, we're back to you. And uh, so your request was to specify a soil and erosion uh, peer review and a uh, to uh, also to establish a uh, soil and erosion inspector during the construction project. Is that correct? Well, I, I would like the commission to determine that that's necessary, yes. Now, okay, so, and, and it can be uh, one person or it can be the same person for both jobs. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that's true, yes. Okay, Is, do you want this in the form of a, a motion? Sure, yes, sure, yes. Okay, at this time, then I'll entertain a motion uh, regarding hiring a soil and erosion control person and also uh, a uh, soil and erosion inspector as the project uh, becomes under construction. So uh, that's the kind of motion I'm looking for. So is there a motion to that effect? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we look into hiring a soil and erosion uh, person uh, to oversee the uh, construction phase and any other part of the project that we need. Okay, is there, uh, is there a second to the motion? Second. Robert Simon, second. Okay, motion made and seconded. Um, is uh, there any other discussion? Commissioners, Mr. then I'll call for a vote. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nick? I have a, uh, Mr. Chairman, Nick, yes, can uh, you hear yes, me? Yes, Aaron. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, Aaron. So, so the, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so it yes, said the, mo the motion was to look into having an erosion, con erosion and sedimentation uh, for construction phase and other parts of the project. We need a peer review for the proposed application. And then separate from that, we would, if this project goes to approval, to an approved permit, for that phase, we would need a inspector, a monitor of the site for erosion control matters. So one okay. is to review then the proposal, and the other is to inspect if it ever be, if it ever is approved. We might not even have to do the second. I mean, we should maybe wait on the okay. second part of that. No. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, Robert, are you going to withdraw your second? That is correct. I withdraw my second. Debbie, you withdraw your motion? Yes, I withdraw my motion. Okay, at this time, I'll entertain a motion, a more uh, delicately described by Aaron for this application. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we look into hiring a soil and erosion control person uh, for this project and a, a peer review person um, to, look, to look over the proposed application. Okay, Aaron, does that satisfy your request? Well, not exactly. Um, we need a peer review of the erosion control plan as presented. Well, that's what she she said. No, it isn't. And then we need later on, if you want to fold that in later on, we need an an, an erosion and sedimentation Make that control. Part a second, a second. Wait a minute, what's going on here? I don't know. <laughs> okay, she. I think she said it, but she did put the peer review first again. Debbie, you want to try again, Aaron? Follow her, uh, pay attention, see if that's what you, what you need. Okay, I'll withdraw my motion. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we hire a peer review person for soil and erosion control. Okay, hold that. Hold that. Let's stop right there. Okay. Okay. So we're going to hire a peer review person for uh, for this application for soil and erosion control. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second. Motion made and seconded. Any other discussion? 
call for a vote. Nick? Yes. Allie? Robert? Yes. Debbie? Yes. Yes. Now I'll entertain a motion that uh, when this application, when if this application gets approved, we're going to have a soil and erosion inspector um, working the site in for the benefit of the town or benefit of the wetlands. Is that all right, Aaron? Uh, an independent uh, soil and erosion inspector, monitor inspector, independent. Actually, last well, time, if I may say, Mr. Chairman, last time it was not just for the Welland Commission. We pooled it. We had a pooled inspector for the Planning and Zoning, Water Division, and Wetlands. Uh, but I don't think we're quite there yet. But if we are going in that direction, we, we might end up pooling it between the three different entities. Well, at least we are in favor of a, an inspector to uh, monitor the soil and erosion control plan. And right. if the you other two commissions come in, the other two commissions come in, they can come in on, on board too. Yes, right? I think it's important to say, should this go to an approval? I mean, we don't know where it's going right now, but should it get there? Yes. Okay. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. There's no motion. Motion made and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? Call for a vote. Nick? Um, yes. Um, Allie? Yes. Robert? Yes. Uh, Mr. Debbie? I think I to the motion. Mr. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're in the middle of a vote here. I know. Okay. Okay. And you voted yes, Debbie? Yes. And I voted yes. Okay. Kathleen, are you trying to come in? Yes, I am, please. I am lost on the phraseology of this second motion. Okay. The, 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 the motion made, the motion was made that the Wetlands Commission is in favor of hiring a, um, a soil and erosion inspector during construction of this project to monitor their um, soil and erosion controls uh, for, the, for the town of Wallingford. The motion was made by Ms. Phillips and seconded by Mr. Simon? Correct. And who were the voters? Nick Kern, Allie, Mr. Simon, Debbie. Yeah. And me. All right. All in favor? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. All right. Um, okay. One one last thing, I, I the applicant. Do you have any other questions tonight, Mr. Cody? Um, no, Mr. Chairman. I think we've covered all of the items that we um, wanted to cover. Uh, I think we understand the schedule for things moving forward. But now you understand that that a lot of the issues from here forward are are in the technical. Uh, nature. They're they're going to be specific to to the the oil water separators and soil erosion control and the plan and uh, water and sewers comments. Uh, sand filters are not going to be in the middle of retention basins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You need to spend as much time as necessary in Aaron's office to discuss it because the this this um, this isn't the workplace in the middle of the meeting. This isn't the workplace to get this resolved. Now, Aaron, is this going to be a month from now for this another virtual meeting? You're not going to try. We haven't even set the date for the next meeting. Well, our regular meeting date is December 2nd. Yeah, I didn't have a 
I didn't have a chance to discuss this matter with Attorney Cody. Um, All right. Why don't you discuss it a little later on? Because in the next, when you get back from having off tomorrow, you and I will discuss the schedule because the December 2nd meeting is already overpacked. We may end up have a virtual meeting every night. The schedule got to be so big. So you're going to have to work with Aaron. I'll t discuss with Aaron before the week is out on what we're going to do with the rest of the uh, uh, items on the agenda. And we'll go from there. If, well, I, if I may, I, I just want to ask Attorney Cody. I mean, there's so much work to be done here. Maybe a month is not too long a time to wait another month. So that more material can be finished and completed by that time. But just a yeah. sense, I'd like to get a sense of that. Well, if I might, looking at the calendar, um, your your regular meeting is on December 2nd. Um, if you were to consider a special meeting during the following week, somewhere around the 9th or 10th of December, that would be a month from now. And, and I think that would be an appropriate amount of time to, to do what we need to do and, and get it into you and not get too close to the holidays. That That's fine, but um, uh, Aaron will acknowledge how much work this application needs, and she's the one that's going to be struggling for the time to be prepared for the December 9th or 10th meeting. I mean, you're certainly, uh, uh, the meetings are all 30 days apart. There's no reason why this virtual shouldn't be 30 days from now with the amount, with the amount of information that's needed. So well, do you want to finalize the date, Aaron? Well, or we could do the following month, December 15th. I mean, what a, how does that sound? Is that? No, 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 no. Because may I suggest, you, may I suggest that we take up the question of the date offline um, after the after the meeting um, so that we can all compare schedules. I do have a number of people on my team that I'd like to try to check in with them on their schedules. You know, I, think, well, I think that's an excellent idea, Mr. Cody. I think that's an excellent idea. And I and I think one of the things that probably um, that might be a value is try to analyze how much work you guys have to produce and how much time it's going to take Aaron to review it and and come up with a date. That makes good sense. Last, if I may interject, last question to be talked about maybe tonight is uh, setting up, maybe the commission should direct me to schedule site investigations for commissioners if certain commissioners want to walk the site. <laughs> Well, that, that's fine. The commissioners can get a hold of you, and they can you can work with uh, uh, the okay. applicant on getting them a site investigation. All right, good. I mean, many of us have been out there within the last couple of years, so I don't think it's it's uh, the only thing we're going to see is a building down, which is was kind of a nice building. Uh, so I think the 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 uh, uh, when you guys decide on the date, where is it going to be posted, Aaron? On the Wallingford website? Well, okay. The uh, just so you know, the chairman can set a special meeting date anytime you choose. So um, you you will set it, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I will call you. You will then set it, and we will post it. First, we post it in the town clerk's office. Uh, then we post it on the um, town website the same day. Um, then we oh, would oh. also put it in the paper. All right, but it's, it'll be on the website uh, probably within a, a week from today. Yes, once we get a date, yeah, I'll do it right away. Okay. Is that agreeable with you, Mr. Cody? Yes, that makes good sense, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, fine. All right. Very good. Then at uh, this time, we're going to close this, not close the public hearing, but end the public hearing for today, 9.33 p.m., and uh, we will continue it 
at a uh, uh, date to be determined. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for putting up with me. And I hope. Uh, Motion to adjourn. Motion to Motion. adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a motion made? Mr. M Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 You guys take care. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you, Jen. Thank you, everyone, for coming.